welcome to our evening service tonight. Uh, if you'll take your hymnals, we'll turn to hymn 391. We have an anchor. We'll stand together as we sing all four verses of 391. Let's pray, and we'll be seated tonight. Father, thank you indeed that you are a rock and our anchor, our <clears throat> stability, that it is you and your work, your spirit, your son, your word, your faithfulness that anchors us in place. And we pray, Father, for all of your people that we would be strong and firm in the grace that we have in Christ. We pray your blessing upon our church and not just ours, but all of your people around the world. Thank you that we can be here tonight, and we ask your blessing uh, upon our services. Teach us your word, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may, of course, be seated. Uh, a couple of announcements. Let's see what's uh, uh, in the bulletin. Uh, Friday, April 19th, is uh, youth activity. Pee Wee Patch will be singing on the 21st. On the 28th, um, we have a new missionary to us. I know that a number of you know uh, Tyler Trometer and the Trometer family, but uh, they will be here. They'll be here all day. He'll be presenting his work in the evening on Sunday, April 28th. And then this isn't in the bulletin, but I want to mention it to you. Um, we have been kind of talking and thinking about, you know, what the, uh, the response of the church should be. But over the next couple of Sundays, uh, the 14th and 21st, we're going to be receiving an offer for Clara Mae Campbell. Uh, formerly Paige, and of course Clara May grew up here. Her mom is still here, Marlene Page, and her husband Mark passed away unexpectedly a couple of weeks ago. So we're gonna, we're gonna. I, I know, you know, just from conversations and things that I've heard, I know that a number of folks have already responded privately. There was a, a GoFundMe page set up, but we're gonna take an offering through the church. So if you want to be a part of that, if you'll just please designate it for the Campbell family or the Page family and we will make sure that it all, of course, gets to them. 
Please take your hymnals again and turn to hymn 349. We'll sing together all four verses of complete in the hymn 349. Turn back a few pages to hymn 281. We'll sing both verses of Calvary's Blood, hymn 281. I carried a burden, a staggering weight, a struggle for freedom, but could not escape. I trembled and cried at the thought of my fate. What must I do to be saved? I desperately searched for release from my pain, but found that man's wisdom was useless in vain. Is there not a power that can break every chain? What must I do to be saved? Jesus, blood flows from Calvary, breaking Satan's power, setting
Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. This is our third Wednesday night dealing with the topic of authority in the church. And I began by talking about deacons. Last Wednesday we talked about elders. <clears throat> and this evening, at least from the traditional Baptist perspective, we will talk about pastors. Although elder is a word used to describe pastors and we'll come back and revisit that which is why we're going to start in 1 Timothy 5. It's not really the bulk of our <clears throat> message tonight but I do want to mention the text. Let's pray and we'll turn our attention to the word. Father as always it is our hope and prayer that all that we do be pleasing and acceptable to you and our most certain guide for what is pleasing and acceptable to you is your word. And so we pray for wisdom and understanding from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, <clears throat> next Sunday, will constitute our for next Sunday, whatever day of the week this is when we meet in seven days. Um, we're going to consider the fourth <clears throat> area of, expert, of authority within the church one of equal importance, and that is you, uh, the assembly in its entirety. <clears throat> uh, it has uh, realms and areas of responsibility that it should not neglect. So we talked about deacons. Deacons is a distinctly biblical office, and the challenge that we encounter is finding a distinct, definitive job description in the text of Scripture or any place where, I mean, we have the word in multiple places to serve, to do service. Um, in the discharge of an office, there's never clearly a place saying the deacons did this. And that's, that just, that's just part of the, to me, the, the challenge of understanding the office. And then there's a different challenge, but an equal challenge. Um, if we add elders into that relationship, that mix. <clears throat> and I just pointed out that this is the dilemma. It is biblically true that all pastors are elders. What is less clear is whether all elders are pastors. And that's one of the reasons that I want to talk just a second about 1 Timothy 5, 17. Did I say 5, 16, 5, 17? This is perhaps the most oft-referred passage when it comes to the subject of elder leadership in a church. Uh, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And that double honor within the framework of 1 Timothy 5, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, is, is first of all, the honor due a dignified office and position, Right? And then secondly, the honor due of financial remuneration. And both of those concepts are addressed in the passage. So it's not really arguing that he's worth twice as much money, but he is worthy of a twofold respect. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of a twofold respect, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now the prevailing way of dealing with that verse is, the, is to look at it like this. See? All elders rule, but not all elders rule by word and doctrine. But there is an equally valid, equally grammatically correct way of looking at it, which is that Paul is making a distinction between the very hardest working elders and those who do not work as hard. And that may sound a little odd to our ears, but it is equally valid. The, the, the question is, is the distinction between teaching elders and non-teaching elders, or is it between hardworking elders and elders who are not discharging their duties nearly as faithfully? Um, but the prevailing sentiment, you must know, is that this is the passage that is used to teach that 
all pastors are elders, but not all elders need to be pastors. And so some elders are just that. They are elders. They rule. They, they have leadership capacity, but they do not minister in the word and doctrine as do pastors, which just goes on then, in my mind, anyway, to, to fuel some of the additional dilemma. And I, you know, had, you know, just kind of a brief conversation with one of the guys this week about this, and I'd had it with somebody else prior, right? If, if elder is a word that is used to describe both a paid pastor and a non-paid leader, is, can it be possibly true that all elders are equal? Is, <clears throat> is there a genuine equality of elders? And does the fact that some elders then are going to be paid and other elders are going to be volunteers alter that in any way? Um, and we're going to look at this. Um, I'm, look, I'm trying to look at the at the verse right now at the top of my head. <clears throat> um, it, we'll we'll get to it when we in a couple of weeks. But do elders answer to the congregation, or do elders answer to elders? And there's some debate about the framework of First Timothy five because it raises the issue of accountability. <clears throat> So is a pastor who is an elder answerable to the elders in a way that he is not answerable to the congregation? And again, the burning question, are there two classes of elders ruling and otherwise? And, and if there is only one true type of elder, which is a pastor, and the Bible always speaks of elders in senses of plurals, is it a mandate that every church should have more than one pastor? Um, and that's really kind of the, and, and, and then folks, to go back to the equality issue, I think, and I ended with this last week, I think we all understand realistically that equality is somewhat elusive. There is certainly, I think, equality of essence. If I could use language we would use about the, the Trinity, there is a quality of essence between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They are equally God. But there is an inequality in function. At this time, at least, the Son answered to the Father. The Father never answers to anybody. Um, so I don't know that arguing that you have to have pastors or all that you have to have elders for the sake of a multiple e equal leadership team is really what the Bible is getting after. Um, because again, there is an equality of essence. There, the, the office of an elder is the office of an elder. And there is the realistic inequality of function. Right? We have, again, in America, we have senior pastors and assistant pastors and youth pastors and music pastors and executive pastors and administrative pastors. Um, and, and, and a church that would have all of those is still going to look to one person who's going to be the, 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 the head of it all. So, so to argue multiple elders and all elders are equal is, I think, a rather simplistic view of something that is a little more complex than that. But it is biblically true that all pastors are elders. And I want to just kind of work through that this evening. Right? There is a possibility that, that there could be elders in a church who are not pastors. I think that you could defend that scripturally if you wanted to go there. I don't think you need to go there, but I think if you wanted to go there, I think you could defend it scripturally. But it is very clear that all pastors are treated as elders and called it elder as elders. And I want to look at some passages that both explain that and then go on to develop what it is that the function of a pastor actually is. So let's turn, first of all, to 1 Peter chapter 5.
First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And one of the reasons I want to start in 1 Peter 5 is because all three words that are used to describe a pastor are found in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. Peter here is talking to a distinct group within the congregation, and that group are elders. And if you recall from our study last week, the word elder also refers simply to age. And so we could raise the question as to whether Peter is simply talking to the older men in the assembly or whether he is talking to the office holder of a pastor. I think the context demands that it be pastor. Um, not the word, because the word is going to be the same, right? Pastor, old man. Um, <clears throat> the context is going to be the deciding factor. But here again, right, is Peter talking to a multiple of pastors in the assembly? Is that what he is finding and expecting? The elders, plural, which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, um, which without trying to impress you with Greek words, we talked last week about the word presbyteros, Presbyterian, the word elder, and there it is there in conjunction with another Greek word that means with or fellow or companion. I am a sum presbyteros. I am an elder with you. I am an elder with you. And then Peter goes on to make a distinguishing mark in his eldership that it would not be true of any other of the elders that he's talking to, and that is that he saw Christ. And he, he saw Christ, and he saw Christ on the cross. So he is, he is here claiming, I think, folks, both the office of a pastor while subtly reminding us that he also occupies the office of an apostle. He is one who has seen the Lord. And again, this is a word that simply describes the person, right? A pastor is an elder in the sense of that, aged, experienced, um, some, some time, right? Some time in Christianity under his belt, some experience under his belt. And these are things that the Bible has historically treasured. Uh, maturity is a process of long experience. And this is something that the Bible has treasured. So there's the first word. I mean, if you're, if you're taking notes, right? And here is, here is the first word used to describe the pastor, and it describes the pastor in his person, and that is an elder, a presbyteros. Verse number two, feed the flock. Feed the flock. There is the second word that describes the office of the pastor, and it is in the word feed, which you can see is a verb. <clears throat> so we have a word that describes the, the pastor as his person, elder, and a word that describes the pastor in his function, feed. Let me just give you some of the places in the New Testament where that word is translated. Matthew 2, 6, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall, our King James Bible translates the word rule. It is the word feed. Luke 17, 7, But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle? Or feeding cattle. John 21, 16. Jesus saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? 
He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto them, Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. There's the word again. And if you look at John 21 in verses 15 and 17, you have this, they have the word feed repeated there. But there it is the verb form of the word pasture. Put my sheep to pasture. Revelation 2.27, he shall rule. Jesus shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. And in Revelation 7.17, now the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Feed them. Shall lead them unto living waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And so you can see here there that like with Revelation 2.27 and Revelation 7.17 that our translators are allowing the context of the word, of the, of the verse to determine what word they're translating the same Greek word with. That Jesus is ruling and Jesus is feeding. But there is the word. This is, this is the word shepherd. Shepherd. A pastor is a shepherd. A pastor is an elder and a pastor is a shepherd. And he shepherds the flock by feeding the flock. We'll come back to this. What does a pastor do? What is the, what is the calling of a pastor? So there's the second word, right? You have the word elder, which describes the pastor in, as kind of a person. And you have the word feed, which describes the pastor in his function. And then you have the third word, which is found in taking the oversight thereof. Taking the oversight thereof. And that's the word episkopos, which gives to us, of course, the word episcopalian. And it is, it, is, it is a word used to describe a particular form of church government, an Episcopal form of church government. Roman Catholics have it, Lutherans have it, Methodists tend to have it. And this is, this is where we find the office of a bishop because that is the word that is translated there. This is another function word. Right? We have a word that describes the pastor as a person. He is an elder he doesn't, right, it's not a function. You don't just stand around being old, although I'm getting pretty good at that. Um, <clears throat> actually, I'm getting better at sitting around being old because when you're old, standing around is something you don't want to do as much as you used to, but that's another subject. And then you have, you have the feed word, and then you have the oversight word. There is only one other verb use of the word episkopos in all the New Testament, and that is Hebrew 12, 15, where it is translated, looking diligently. Looking diligently. Lest any man fail the grace of God. So a pastor is then, by title, an elder. And by function, a guardian shepherd pastoring, pasturing the flock on God's word. He has an oversight responsibility diligent observation responsibility and a feeding responsibility. So there's, there's the first passage. And, and without going back and revisiting it, again, I think the context of the verses helps us to see that the elders are pastors because of the other two words that are used there, feed and oversight. These are responsibilities given to Pastors. Let's, let's look at the second passage, and that's Titus chapter number 1. <clears throat> Titus chapter number 1. <clears throat> and here, by the way, is a passage that, at least in my estimation absolutely blows to smithereens this idea of the only biblical model of leadership is a multiplicity of a plurality of elders because we don't want too much power vested in one person. For this cause left I thee in Crete. I answered to no one. I accounted to no one. I received counsel from no one. This is why I, Paul the Apostle, left you, Titus, in Crete. 
that thou shouldest set in order things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So here we have the Apostle Paul acting on his own, commissioning a Titus who acts on his own to ordain to set in place on his own authority through his own wisdom and judgment elders presbyteros presbyteros again we could raise the question well is is what Titus doing is what he is doing under Paul's instruction is he setting in place simply a group of leadership men. Well, I think the context kind of argues against that. And that's because of verse number 7. Because a bishop. Because a bishop. Because an episkopos. Right? We, keep, we keep using these words Presbyterian and Episcopal. We keep using these words to describe and we use them in conjunction, describing the same work and the same person discharging these duties because a bishop, an Episcopos, an overseer must be a certain kind of man. And, and this is the word that is used, right? It is in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 1. Bishops, deacons, and the church. Bishop, deacons, and the church. And again, we can come and we can pose the same questions that we keep asking. Are, we know that our, all pastors are elders. Are all elders pastors? Are all elders pastors? And then the third passage. Right, so we have 1 Timothy 5 2, in which we have eldership, and we have overseer, and we have feeding, and Titus, where we have elders, and we have them as overseers. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 17. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. 
Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And we will stop there. So Paul calls for the elders, Acts 20, 17, the presbyteros of the church. So you have multiple elders in a singular church. One church, plurality of elders. And then he goes on to explain that they know how he has lived and the way he has behaved himself. And you know the things that I have taught, that I have not kept back anything that would be to your profit, but I have taught you all things. And then he says, verse number 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. And this is the noun form of the verb that we've seen translated feed or shepherd. Right, this is, right, sometimes you make jokes about it and sometimes you make light of it. But we are God's flock. And to the flock God has given shepherds. And they have shepherding responsibilities. That is, that is their calling. That is their mandate. <clears throat> so take heed to yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's that word episkopos again or episcopalians. To feed it. And there's that word to shepherd it again. Now, I think, folks, that honesty would just compel me to, to point out that this could be a responsibility given to multiple men, not all of whom have pulpit ministry, but they all have the same responsibility, and that is the oversight of the flock. And the question there would be, how do you feed a flock if you are not ministering it the word of God? If all elders are elders and all elders have the same responsibility and all elders have an equality, then folks, biblically, all elders have to be in the pulpit. They have to be in the pulpit. Right, because the, the burning question, and right, and, and I cannot begin to express to you how grateful I am and in sometimes relieved I am that this is a great liberty that I enjoy at Westwood Heights Baptist Church that many pastors in the conservative fundamental Baptist world do not enjoy. And that is, I am pretty much free, and in fact, the main expectation levied upon me is to do the job that God has called me to do. What do pastors do? What do pastors do? And what we find pastors in America doing are multiple dozens of things. They are administrators and managers and leaders and visionaries and vision casters. And, but that is not at all what a pastor is. That is not at all what a pastor is. He's not a, he's not a businessman. Maybe he could be a businessman, but he's not a businessman. And and he's not a CEO, and he's not the visionary guy looking out into the future as a futurist, setting the direction for the church in the next five years. He is a shepherd of the flock. He is a shepherd of the flock. And the mandate is to feed the flock. Now you think about it, folks. What, what is the primary thing that a shepherd does with reference to his flock? He takes it where there's food to eat. He doesn't, he doesn't force feed the sheep, but he takes them where there's food. He sees to it that they're in a place where there's food, and then he sees to it that they're safe while they're there. This is the task of the New Testament shepherd. Feed the flock of God, 1 Peter 5. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye will receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. As somebody has put it, 
the only true senior pastor is Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. All the rest of us are assistant pastors, under shepherds. Or 1 Peter 2, 25, Peter says to these people, Ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The shepherd and bishop of your soul. That's what Jesus is. That is what he appoints pastors to do. You, now, so I will just say this, and, and I, I, I'm not saying it to solicit any feedback positive or negative, but you know me, folks, and some of you know me better than others. Administration is not my thing. I don't do details well. In my home life, I, I dump all the details on my wife, and in my church life, I dump all the details on Kelly, and then I don't have to deal with details, and that's good by me because details bore me, right? I'm not a detail guy, and I just am not. And I'm not a counselor. I'm not a counselor. And I am in particular not a counselor that is a therapist. I can't help you in that way. And it took me a long time to get to the place where I understood that I couldn't help you that way. But I can't help you that way. I would send you to one if you thought you needed one, but I am not one. I am a shepherd. This is what I can do. I can go, here's what the Bible says. I'm not saying it's always a home run. You're not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. Every church service isn't a home run. But every church service is the word of God. Here it is. Best effort to get it to you, to put it in front of you, to make it understandable, to make it digestible, to make it useful to you. That's the calling of the shepherd. That's his work. And to keep the sheep safe, to warn them of dangers in the world, dangers in false religion. That's, that's the Lord Jesus' work. That's the work that he calls the shepherds to do. This is the work of the pastor. And, and, and if, if, an, if an elder goes, I'm an elder, but I'm not a pastor, but then he has, but he has the same responsibilities, right? He doesn't get to have the same office without having the same responsibilities. I don't think you can go, well, there are teaching pastor elders and non-teaching elders because every time we find an elder being told to do something, he's tending to the flock by feeding it, by, by feeding it. And when you, when you go through your New Testament, folks, right? Peter is a great example of this. What do you find Peter doing every time you find him doing something? It is preaching or writing a Bible book. And since pastors are not allowed to write books of the Bible any longer, they preach. They teach the word that has been written. That is their responsibility. Okay, I'm going to stop there this evening. Next Wednesday night, next Wednesday night, the authority of the congregation. The authority of the congregation. God has charged you with things to do that do not include teaching Sunday school and singing in the choir. And so it is a critically important concept as well, and we'll go from there. All right. Oh, we probably want to take some prayer requests, don't we? My apologies. <clears throat> I'm a forgetful shepherd. <clears throat> is there anything that you need to add or would like to add or update on the prayer bulletin? No, we're good. All right, let's go to the Lord and we'll, we will be dismissed this evening. Father, thank you for the local church. It is yours. It is yours. You bought us with your blood. And you are its head. And you are its chief shepherd. I thank you for this assembly and for the liberty that I have to give the bulk of my time to preparing to feed these people. May that be so of all pastors. May we understand and rise to our calling. And Father, we pray for your will to be done when the day comes that there will be another shepherd of this congregation, your flock, your shepherd, we pray for your will to be done. And Father, we thank you for your great power and your kind disposition toward us. And we 
hold up all of these requests, those that need to be saved. We pray for a great outpouring of your spirit to save the lost. And those that need to be healed. And those that need to be encouraged and strengthened. Father, our hope is in you and in nothing else. And we pray these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks so much for being here this evening. God bless you and good night.